Hello and welcome to Blueprints for Modern Government Workforce, brought to you by KPMG. I'm your host, George Jackson. Today, modernization is non-negotiable, especially for public sector organizations. They need to leverage technology to deliver on mission and improve the constituent experience. But how does modernization affect the workforce? Today, you'll meet a group of leaders, all experts in tech enablement, for a deep dive on modern workforce strategy to help you redesign and support your workforce to be more competitive in the digital age. Let's kick things off with retired Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Greco, Executive Deputy of Training and Education Command for the U.S. Marine Corps. Quimby Kayser, Principal of Advisory and Transformation Delivery at KPMG. Glenn Jones, Activity Command Information Officer and Information Technology Division Director for the Naval Surface Warfare Center Dahlgren Division inside Naval Sea Systems Command. All thanks for being here. Quimby, let me start with you. Let's talk a little bit about hiring a next generation workforce. Is this an issue for public sector organizations across the board right now? It is for the clients that I have, and I think it is something that has existed for the last 20 years, so I don't think it's anything new. Um, there's been a uh, less people who are wanting to go into public service. Uh, there's less um, and more demand for people that are um, competing for uh, students who are coming out of college. Uh, there's data that shows that uh, people who don't start in public service uh, with government directly, it's difficult to transition mid-career. There's a lot of barriers. Um, we know that millennials uh, wanted some job flexibility and choices even five years ago before COVID. And I think that the pandemic and this um, kind of universal experience that we've all had now with COVID is shows, shows that it worked. We can work in a hybrid environment. And so now I think there's just more choices. I think individuals are asking questions about what their preferences are and um, what options are available to them. And I think, so I think it's, it's definitely a factor and something that um, all organizations, I think, are, are struggling with right now is, is getting and attracting people to their organizations. Do you feel that competition, that pressure of competition, Colonel, inside the Marine Corps? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, it's always, uh, it's difficult, I think, in some ways in the government sector because a lot of times, based on the position you're hired into, there is no real grade increase other than by step for the individuals that take the job. So often, unless the organization has vacancies that come open, their only real option is to seek employment elsewhere, whether that be in the government or in the private sector. So there's always competition for the best talent. So Glenn, how much of your workforce is coming back? I mean, this pandemic prompted a massive shift to telework, people working remotely. What does it look like today and what do you think it's gonna look like in the future? Well, we're still less than 50%. and. Because of the nature of our business, we are a warfare center. We, we fire weapons off uh, downrange uh, on the Potomac River. But um, there is a, a large portion of our workforce that are uh, computer scientists, computer engineers that do a lot of uh, application development. And as a result, you know, in the, in the old way of thinking was, hey, let's bring everybody on base, right? so that um, we can put them in their, their lock spaces in their secure rooms and they can get the job done. Well, with COVID, it's kind of given us a, a, a wake-up call and we've kind of adjusted our technology. We've adjusted our approach to what work can be done from home, right? We, we, uh, we want to remain secure, but at the same time, a lot of our computer scientists uh, have the capability now to be able to not have to come on base, be stuck in a corner to develop uh, uh, software, they can do that work from home. And uh, so we don't know, I, I will never say never, right? But I, I, I think it, we'd be hard pressed to say that everyone's gonna come back like it used to be. Because once you've given them a taste of that flexibility of being able to get the job done without having to commute, it, um, it, it adds kind of a, uh, a, a benefit to the job, you know? And if you take that away, right? And then, and then we have a harder time retaining talent. So uh, I think we're in a new era when it comes to public service, uh, especially when it comes to, let's say, uh, conventional uh, uh, military commands, right, where you expect everybody to come in. Uh, now we're looking at a, an entirely new way of doing work. I mean, that strikes me as a very difficult balance 
to find? How do you advise organizations on strategy for, you know, right sizing their workforce for the future? So I think it starts with strategy. Uh, you have to know how your workforce is supporting the mission of the organization and thinking strategically about the role that people play. Um, I think that in, in the past, uh, you know, we think about people process and technology, maybe the people agenda wasn't as prominent as it needs to be now. So thinking about the role that the workforce plays in your mission and, and then being uh, deliberate in thinking about how to design the work, not where and how you're located, but what's really needed for the job that needs to be that needs to be done, and and that's giving us all an opportunity to revisit and, and almost rebaseline and start. I want to say start over. You can't completely start over, but to really assess and think about your design principles so that that um, that one well, the mission can be accomplished, but that the experience that the employees are having while accomplishing that mission meets their needs too. And and where where that happens, then good things happen. Let's make a deep dive here into kind of resources, proper resources, getting these workforce transformations prioritized in the right way. Tony, before you had talked about resiliency as a key tenant to that, could you expand upon that and maybe just talk a little bit about the factors you have to consider? Yeah, I'd like to piggyback off a little bit of what Quimby said. I think some of it is building agility and flexibility into your organization. And fortunately for us, uh, one of the things that we had in place with our employees already were telework agreements. So despite the fact that it was difficult to predict the pandemic, we already had in place an understanding that at least situationally, our folks could telework and that there were some who had limitations. Uh, the ability to, to hinge off of the technology that's available today, understanding what we already had in place with regards to their ability to flex from the in-place environment to remote was critically important in us having a seamless relatively seamless transition to a hybrid environment, which I think, as we've kind of talked about uh, before we came on, is probably the new normal. And it will probably ebb and flow based on the situation. You know, the, the flare-ups will have impact, uh, the ability to establish more of a, a, a flexible work environment through technology and through our understanding of, of the resiliency of our workforce is critically important. But one of the things we talked about uh, before we came in also was the personal touch is still an important thing, and sometimes it's much more difficult to establish that rapport and be able to have a real sense of, of what your folks are going through without being able to talk to them in person. Yeah, it's that whole serendipity thing, you know, things that happen in the office that you, it's hard to rec recreate virtually. You walk in, you know, cubicle to cubicle, talking to employees, engaging one another, you know, it, that's something that's hard to overcome. But it's possible, right? Yeah. Uh, with collaboration tools. Uh, we utilize them a lot now. Uh, two years ago, they didn't exist for our organization. And now, as a, let's say as a supervisor, you can actually drop in. You have to be more intentional about it, yeah. right? But you drop in on your employees via chat site, say, hey, how you doing? And it may not be the warm and fuzzy that you get on site, but you can still have some of that serendipity via collaboration tools. And we had some security challenges initially too. There were some platforms that we just couldn't use based on the lack of or relative lack of security compared to others. But once we got past that, it became a, a pretty easy way to have that regular communication. And I will tell you that most of our leadership holds their staff meetings via electronic media so that they can at least see their folks on a regular basis, if only on screen and not in person. Yep. So that digital aspect, where have you seen pockets of innovation in your work across the public sector, Quimby, where, you know, organizations are closing that skills gap that's emerging? So, you know, for, you know, to close the skills gap, you've also got to recognize where the gaps are. And I think, you know, for the, for the clients that we're serving, I can use um, Health and Human Services as an example, client of ours who has very deliberately identified um, and using analytics and data to support this predictive analytics on what uh, you know who's going to potentially um, you know leave the organization and what are the predictors, what are the factors that may prompt that to happen? It could be anything from um, you know um, retirement, which is a clear one, or uh, distance in a commute or what have you, to identify where there may be you know pockets of gaps and then 
using that information and putting it in the hands of the managers, which we think is also really important, having you know, data but not in the hands of people who have something, you know, the ability to do something with it, so that then you can look at closing that skills gap, whether that's with training and upskilling or whether that's with even just recruiting and then using data uh, in order to support that analysis as well. So you can start to use these insights to just sort of be more product, uh, more uh, predictive and really more proactive in what those uh, initiatives you know, may be. And they've seen some tremendous results where the time from uh, from identifying a gap to the time of hiring people has been closed by almost 50%, almost in line with, with the uh, private sector, which it really has huge impact to the people who are being recruited, right? Yeah. Because that time to hire is a, is a big barrier for, you know, for bringing in talent. One thing that we haven't talked about yet that I think has been a keen focus of the Department of Defense, Marine Corps in particular of late, is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Where does that fall in this conversation, Tony? I think it's a part of every conversation. The more diverse your workforce, the more capable you're going to be. You know, we're a f reflection of our society. And quite frankly, if we're all of the same mold, you're going to have groupthink that's not going to be actually helpful to what you're trying to achieve from a mission accomplishment perspective. So for us, that's always a goal. We're constantly evaluating our processes with be regards to hiring, retention, et cetera, to make sure that we're getting the best talent and as diverse a workforce as we're capable of recruiting. Has this time period, Glenn, made that easier, hiring a more diverse workforce just simply because you can, you know, look at a broader landscape? Yeah, uh, I think uh, Dahlgren is a classic example. Our command's located in Beautiful, sunny King George, Virginia, okay? Um, we're far away from D.C., right? And it's hard getting that, that talent pool that you may have here. But with uh, uh, telework and with um, the ability to work virtually, we've, able, we've been able to extend our net to, to reach out to uh, talent that we would have never been able to get before because a lot of their work could be done from home. Um, and then we have more people willing to live on the outskirts as opposed to live near the city because this whole new telework environment, uh, we're now in the game when it comes to competing for top talent. Uh, I, I kind of want to go back to one of the early discussion points about uh, the public sector, right, competing for jobs against private sector. I do think we need to kind of reevaluate how we advertise, how we package public sector jobs, and really start thinking about the future and uh, uh, having more of a theme uh, to public service, right? This is about uh, sacrifice, it's about giving, it's about making a difference. You don't hear that as much anymore as you used to years ago, right? Um, and, and we could really draw a unique talent that, that may be more focused on, on the mission of, of supporting others, which is what we do. Yeah, and actually the, there's a word for that, and it's called an employee value proposition. And so and it's, it's a perfect synopsis of being clear of what benefits your organization offers an employee and making sure that that's front and center when you're recruiting, when you're, you know, because it's the, it's the cultural uh, and the value base that keeps people engaged in your organization. So not enough people use employee value propositions and really being strategic about what you provide because your value proposition is going to meet someone's need, right? Who's going to be attracted to your organization. A great conversation. Quimby, Glenn, Tony, thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. It's been awesome. Thanks for having us. Hiring talented IT professionals and training them for the future is important, but organizations also need to outfit them with the right tools to do the job, like advanced modern technology that eliminates mundane tasks and frees them up for higher level work. After the break, we'll continue the conversation with experts at the state and local level. You're watching Blueprints for Modern Government Workforce on GovExec TV. I'll be right back. Our world is changing fast. Government increasingly finds itself bearing a heavy burden from heightening public demand for services, solutions, leadership. We can anticipate the change ahead to build a government that is connected, offering employees meaningful work in a flexible environment, enabling resilient communities and providing citizens with positive experiences. 
trusted, placing the highest priority on security and privacy, understanding the importance of safeguarding data from theft and unauthorized use. Howard, hiring professionals who can use technology and innovation to transform public services. Power governments enable resiliency, scalability, and responsiveness to achieve agency mission. We call this modern government, and we'd like to tell you more about it. Welcome back to Blueprints for Modern Government Workforce. On GovExec TV, I'm George Jackson. Many future-focused organizations are making a concerted shift away from brick and mortar to more digital and data-driven workspaces. State and local governments are no exception. Let's get some of those perspectives now. Reed Walsh is Deputy Secretary for Human Resources and Management for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Clifton Pay is Director of Customer Focused Government for the State of Tennessee. And Chris Schuster is Managing Director of Human Capital at KPMG. Chris, let's start with you. What sort of landscape workforce-wise are public sector organizations dealing with right now? Yeah, thanks for that question, George. I, I think that like private and you know, other public sectors, um, everyone is challenged at the moment in terms of looking at their human capital, their, their workforce landscape to determine what is next. We hear about uh, never going back uh, to previous sort of pandemic levels of on-site employment. Um, work itself is being redefined. Terms like well-being at work are being completely redefined. And organizations are not only in the middle of a talent battle, right? They're also trying to deal with how are we going to support employees uh, who need to or may want to continue to work in this hybrid way at scale. There was that reactive mode when we first were impacted by the pandemic and now it's what will be the future steady state beyond that. Thanks for that, Chris. Reed, expand upon that a little bit. Have you had to change the way that you sort of look for talent, change the places where you look for talent? Yeah, I think we definitely had. I think, you know, in general, you know, governments are realizing that there's um, a better atmosphere to look for talent. With the remote work being available, you really can pull from different places. You can recruit differently. You can advertise your positions as telework. In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we are definitely moving into a hybrid environment. That allows us to pull talent in places that we wouldn't have traditionally thought of. So if people aren't necessarily wanting to move to the capital city of Harrisburg, I can pull them from Philadelphia. I can pull them from Pittsburgh. There are all new talent pools that we can tap into now in this hybrid environment. So Clifton, you may be the best suited guest for this particular question. You're joining us remotely via Zoom. How do you think this pandemic long term is going to change the way that workforce interacts with each other digitally? How's it going to change digital services? Absolutely. And that's a great question, George. And again, thank you for having me this morning. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Reed. Good morning. The way that the state of Tennessee has been, been positioned, we've had in place for almost six years our program that we call Alternative Workplace Solutions. And the way this program was designed, initially it was a strategy to help reduce the real estate footprint of the state of Tennessee. And fast forward to 2020, at the time we had about 9,000 employees who were basically equipped, had gone through the proper training to work in a remote environment. As a result of the pandemic, we basically had to accelerate that model to where we had almost 30,000 employees working remotely. Mm -hmm. As a result of the pandemic and the existing framework that we had in place from our work remote program, we were able to build on that, more importantly, learn a lot of best practices and lessons learned as to how we can apply that going forward. I think the way that AWS has worked for our state has been beneficial from a recruiting and a retainment stamp retention standpoint. State of Tennessee is the largest employer within the state. That's probably the best recruiting tool that we have in our tool belt is to present that as an option to prospective employers saying, hey, look, majority of our workforce is in a hybrid workforce or a hybrid model, but we're trying to find more ways to uh, expand and, and accelerate that, that remote work program. And so the way that we see that working here at the state, it will continue to be an integral part of the state strategy, but more importantly, an integral part of how we recruit top talent within the state of Tennessee. 
You know, I think it's really interesting to hear from Clifton, who's been in the telework environment for quite a few years now, and Pennsylvania, who's new to the telework environment. And I think the benefit of that is we are able to test our assumptions. We might have had managers and supervisors, because we all know change happens at middle management, that weren't willing to go into that environment. The pandemic forced us. We got to test it out. We got to see what worked, what didn't work. Now we have time for preparation. How are we going to equip everybody? Um, how does our IT work? And what's the communication between IT and the business? And how are we strengthening those relationships in order to truly drive success when we come back from the pandemic that we're currently in? So Chris, Clifton mentioned retention. What does workforce reskilling have to do with that equation? Well, most simply put, George, it's really about employees feeling engaged and knowing that their employer is engaged in their future and their career development. At the very basic level, we all want to feel confident in our work and know that we're doing our jobs properly. We're helping the organization we're working for meet its goals. We're best serving our citizens, if you will. So the idea of upskilling first always starts with understanding where your skill gaps are and how your current workforce is aligned to that future strategy. You, you may have to go out and hire some additional folks and make investments there. But in many ways, there aren't enough folks to fill those jobs. And so upskilling folks and investing in their career, defining what those career personas and journeys look like, and engaging with employees along that so that at any point they feel engaged, they understand where they're heading in their career, and they know what they need to know next. And so there are all these new approaches to upskilling, learning in the flow of work, and the like that help employees keep up, frankly, with the skills that they need. So for both of my guests from state government, and Reed, let's start with you. Talk a little bit about where diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives fall in this discussion. Like, what kind of focus do you have in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania around DEI? Sure. DEI is extremely important to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, and I think culture is extremely important to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And so I think a lot of culture starts with what's the makeup of your leadership? Who are the people that you're putting in your key positions? Are you focusing more on the technical skills needed? Are you focusing more on the leadership skills? And I think that's going to be really important for all of us as leaders to understand who's in our stable that's passing the message on of culture to all the employees, because we're all at the top of the pyramid. We have a really big job to push that culture down. So how are we getting those people in our leadership ranks that understand what it means to truly move the needle, to have a culture of innovation, to have a culture where everybody wants to work? I highly recommend looking at roadmaps, IT roadmaps. So I'm the head of HR. Our IT roadmap was one of the first thing I, I, was, I, I planned when I moved to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We need to have people working in spaces and places where they think it's cool, it's interesting, it's fun, it's innovative. Now, it's not fast change, but having that intentional work on your IT roadmap is going to be huge. We have an HR service center that handles a lot of transactional work in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and we gave them a stretch project. It was to do bot automation. It didn't necessarily need to go in production. There was no expectation for output out of it, but it really was just an exercise in getting employees comfortable and doing it themselves and thinking about cool things they could do. They got to choose what process we are going to automate. They got to choose the name of the bot and all of those things, fun things that make it a really fun experience while they're upskilling themselves. And they're not calling it that. They're not thinking that, oh, I'm sitting here upskilling myself. They're engaging in something because it's interesting, because um, it, it's going to make their work easier. And I think it's really important to kind of hit those balances between you know, saying, now we're upskilling you and giving them those stretch assignments that are cool for them to do, and they get a lot of personal enjoyment from doing them. So Clifton, I was watching you during that answer, and it seemed like something resonated in there for you. Could you elaborate for our audience? Yeah, absolutely, George. And and Reed mentioned culture and, and how important that is to how we operate, how we provide services for our citizens. More importantly, how do we provide for certain professional development opportunities for our workforce? Here at the state of Tennessee, diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a statewide strategy for over a year now. Governor Lee last year wanted to address this issue and assembled a statewide working group to identify best practices as to how we can build upon that culture. How can we make DNI more prominent at the state? How are we trying to identify that next wave of talent within the state that 
for whatever reason, just isn't being recognized or given the right type of training to where they can eventually move up to in state government. I'm proud to serve on a, a DEI council within the Department of Finance and Administration, and we meet monthly to have these types of conversations. How are we going about identifying talent? How are we going about providing the right training so that they, they have those opportunities? There's a saying that you can't be what you can't see. And I think the way that our workforce is structured, there, there are some challenges that we'll, we'll be the first to admit that, but I think we're, we're taking the necessary steps in a very deliberate way to ensure that we are, again, trying to provide our talent with the best resources, the best training to where we can build on our rich culture. And again, putting folks within positions of leadership that they wouldn't normally have those opportunities in the past. You know, and I like what Clifton said about um, being intentional and bringing committees together. And from a human resources perspective, we're there to be the functional arm. And talking across lines and, and talking to the business is extremely important. Building those relationships, that we have those frank conversations, that we set goals, that we make definitive plans to set those goals, and we check back in on them. A lot of things are achieved through conversation, and I think it's a really important step to doing any of the uh, culture work that we're all looking to achieve. And to action DEI, just to build on that or sort of double click on it a little bit, I think so many organizations have come out and made public statements about their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And those were important at the outset uh, of, of this. And But I do think it's how do we action that? That is the critical next step that employees are looking for. It, it, how do we both understand what the social determinants of inequity at work are? And then beyond that, how do, how do we understand how that shows up in our organizations? And then what's the art of the possible, the ways we can address things like bias and inequity in our workforce mm -hmm. and the community? Community that we serve. We're asking all of ourselves to do a really big thing. It's a really big thing to tackle. And I think the most important thing is intention. And sometimes it's the micro movements that are most important. So, you know, where can you affect change? Can we set up a recruitment program for the police force, for our capital police force in the area where our capital is and be intentional about a program? That's a small example of something we did in Pennsylvania. But those small examples and those small things you do and intention you put into those micro movements really do have impact. They really do influence who your ranks are. And then, you know, when people can see the ranks changing, I do think it attracts more talent. So it really does build on itself. Clifton, I want to give you the final word here. In, in a word or two or a phrase, like what, are, what should organizations be focused on right now in this area, in this workforce area? Absolutely. It's a, it's a good question, George. I think just re retention is so important. Um, we have, have experienced a lot over the last year and a half, and organizations are trying to reassess how they're structured. Do they need to reduce their, their, their spans and layers of control? Are they doing enough to, to identify, again, that next wave of, of talent? But looking within, there are a lot of qualified folks that work across state governments, across the country. And if we, again, just take the time to identify and, and try and foster those individuals within, within our environment, I think that's such an important part of why the state of Tennessee has been so successful in terms of delivering a lot of the priorities that the governor has outlined. But, but again, just making sure that we're looking inward first, making sure that the folks that have already bought into our culture are in a position where they can continue to communicate and, and promote that culture. And once that happens, I think from a, an enterprise level, um, that will help us continue to be, one, the employer of choice, but two, for us to continue to provide these critical services that our citizens rely on and desperately need. Well, Clifton, Reed, Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks to our audience for tuning in. I hope you learned a few strategies that will help you leverage technology to redesign and support your workforce and be more competitive in the digital age. Join me back here on September 28th for the next installment of Blueprints for Modern Government Trust. For GovExec, I'm George Jackson. <laughs>